The Space Mountain at Disneyland Paris is probably their best ride. I know for sure it was my favorite ride when I went there. This Space Mountain is unique from all the other Space Mountains in the world, and in my opinion, it's the best Space Mountain in the world. So in this video, I'm going to explain to you the man that inspired not only this ride, but generations of aerospace engineers. The story behind this unique attraction began in the 1800s with a pioneer in the sci-fi genre named Jules Verne. Jules Verne was a French novelist and in 1865 he wrote a novel called From the Earth to the Moon. In this novel he tells the story of a Baltimore gun club that was set on building a space gun that would be able to launch man from the earth to the moon. In 1880 the Pall Mall Gazette referred to the craft that would take man from the earth to the moon as a spaceship, which is the first time a vehicle such as this was ever referred to as such. In my last video I talked about the aviation pioneer Alberto Santos Dumont. He specifically named Jules Verne as his inspiration behind designing his flying machines. Rocketry pioneer Robert Goddard also took inspiration from the novel From the Earth to the Moon. The Apollo 8 mission was the first mission to orbit the moon. The commander of that mission, Frank Borman, had this to say about Jules Verne. In a very real sense, Jules Verne is one of the pioneers of the space age. The famous American astronomer Edwin Hubble was so inspired by novels from Verne such as 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, From the Earth to the Moon, and Journey to the Center of the Earth that he left his profession in law to pursue his true passion in science. Jules Verne also inspired another pioneer. But this was not a pioneer of the aerospace industry. This was a pioneer of the entertainment industry, Walt Disney. As a futurist himself, Walt Disney seemed to be captivated by Verne's stories. So much so that Disney produced three different films based on Verne's novels. Those films included Around the World in 80 Days and the famous 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the latter of which he even created an attraction based around. When Disney Imagineers were coming up with the plans for Euro Disney, which is now known as Disneyland Paris, they decided they wanted to take Tomorrowland in a new direction. In the past, Imagineers had always struggled with this section of the park. The main issue they were facing with Tomorrowland is that the concept of what lies in the future is always evolving. This section of the park would get outdated so quickly that honestly at times it kind of felt like Todayland, or even Yesterdayland. So they decided that this Tomorrowland would be different from all the other Tomorrowlands previously conceived. This section of the park would instead be called Discoveryland. So instead of basing this section of the park on what our idea of tomorrow looks like today, they would instead use the concept of what tomorrow would look like from the past. So in other words, Discoveryland would be themed off the idea of tomorrow from the past. They wanted Discoveryland to look like a retro steampunk version of the future that never existed. In other words, this is what authors like Jules Verne thought the future might look like in the 1800s. And in fact, they would take several Jules Verne's novels and turn them into attractions inside the land. Which brings us back to Space Mountain. The Imagineers decided that the staple attraction of this section would be Space Mountain de la Terre à la Lune, or From the Earth to the moon, based on the novel of the same name. On this ride, you play a part of one of the members of the Baltimore Gun Club. And in this case, you're going to join the astronauts aboard the Columbiad on a trip to the moon. After you board the train, you're then loaded into the chamber of the Columbiad space gun. And it's at this point in Jules Verne's novel that we start to see some striking similarities between what actually happened with the Apollo program and what he wrote in his novel. In his book, the Baltimore Gun Club plans to launch you to the moon from Florida. And Verne was absolutely correct in predicting that Florida would be where the rocket would be launched to the moon. As I mentioned back in my Mission Space video, Florida is the perfect location for America to launch its rockets. Not only is it safer to launch over the water away from populated areas, but it's also closer to the equator, which allows for better launch capabilities. The Columbia projectile itself was also pretty close to the dimensions of the Apollo capsule. And in fact, both the fictional capsule and the Apollo capsule both housed three astronauts. As I mentioned earlier, the capsule was called the Columbia, and the Apollo 11 capsule was called the Columbia. 
But the similarities from this novel in real life don't stop there. In his novel, Jules Verne estimated that it would cost about five million four hundred and forty six thousand six hundred and seventy five US dollars to launch a man from the earth to the moon. And when we adjust for inflation, that comes to about $12 billion in 1969 money. The actual cost of the Apollo program up to Apollo 8 was $14 billion, meaning that he was only off about $2 billion. And when you're talking about space budget money, that's pretty dang close. Vern even calculated the escape velocity required to leave the influence of Earth's gravitational forces. According to his calculations, you needed to be traveling at about 12,000 yards per second. And we now know today that the escape velocity is actually about 12,200 yards per second, which to me is pretty astonishing because Vern definitely didn't have a calculator. Not only that, but Vern also predicted that the capsule would return to Earth by splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. And this is exactly what Apollo 11 did. These predictions were so accurate, it even warranted a mention from the Apollo 11 crew itself. During their return journey from the moon, Apollo 11 commander Neil Armstrong said the following about Jules Verne. A hundred years ago, Jules Verne wrote a book about a voyage to the moon. His spaceship, Columbia, took off from Florida and landed in the Pacific Ocean after completing a trip to the moon. Seems appropriate to us to share with you some of the reflections of the crew as the modern day Columbia completes its rendezvous with the planet Earth in the same Pacific Ocean tomorrow. Having said all of that, Vern was no psychic. He didn't know exactly how a man would get to the moon. The first and most obvious mistake that Jules Vern made in his predicting how man would get to the moon was the use of an actual cannon. In his novel, he foresaw the construction of a 900-foot cannon to shoot man from the earth all the way to the moon. And although the mechanics are similar in that we also shoot man on a tiny little capsule from the surface of the earth all the way to the moon, the logistics are very different. Beyond the logistical nightmare of having to build a 900-foot cannon, if you were to create a cannon that was meant to accelerate a man from zero to escape velocity in just under the height of the Eiffel Tower, you would create almost a thousand G's of forces, which would spell instantaneous death for any human. Fatality. If you've ever seen any rocket take off a launch pad, you'll notice that the acceleration is always very slow in the beginning. Rockets use this slow, steady, consistent acceleration until they reach their desired velocity. This is done for a number of reasons. The first of which, it keeps the G-forces that the astronauts experience relatively low. On a typical manned flight, astronauts don't experience more than 3 Gs. And that's not to say 3 Gs is nothing. 3 Gs sustained as long as the astronauts have to endure it is no joke. But it's certainly not going to kill you. The second main reason that rockets accelerate so slowly is to minimize the effects of drag. Any vehicle that needs to leave Earth's atmosphere has to push its way through a lot of air. So if you were to accelerate from zero to escape velocity in just 900 feet, you would lose a lot of that velocity by the time you left Earth's atmosphere. So it's really just not economical at all to accelerate a vehicle that quickly just for it to lose all the energy again before it even leaves Earth's atmosphere. The third reason the space gun concept isn't all that feasible also has to do with air resistance. Jules' fictional vehicle, the Columbia, was made mostly of aluminum. The Apollo 11 Columbia was also made mostly of aluminum. However, at that speed, and at that altitude, it would almost certainly burn up before it even left the atmosphere. That's another reason that rockets wait until they're at higher altitudes where there's less drag to accelerate even further. So coming back to our Space Mountain experience, we're now inside the Columbiad Space Gun Chamber. Once the train is securely inside, you accelerate from zero to 44 miles an hour in just 1.8 seconds, up to a height of about 141 feet making it the tallest space mountain and the fastest in the world. From there you follow a path of over 3,000 feet that features three different inversions, all the while experiencing thematic elements made to simulate your voyage to the moon. This ride was an instant hit with park goers. It was such a hit that it's said by many that this was the ride that single-handedly saved Disneyland Paris. 
Before the opening of this ride, the park was hemorrhaging money. And just a few short months later, after this ride opened, they saw their first profit. Although this ride has since been rethemed to incorporate Disney's new intellectual property, Star Wars, the legacy of this ride lives on. It still features the same launch and the track layout is the same. The only real difference is the theming. So now instead of a journey from the Earth to the Moon, you're launched through hyperspace right into the middle of a Star Wars space battle. Although the original concept for this ride has been lost, Jules Verne's legacy lives on throughout the parks around the world. And the park with perhaps the most influence from Jules Verne is Tokyo Disney Sea. There you will find several Jules Verne attractions inspired by his novels, such as 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Journey to the Center of the Earth. Jules Verne was without a doubt one of the most influential science fiction authors in history. He inspired generations of astronauts, engineers, and explorers to go forth boldly where no man had gone before. His stories are the perfect example to us that, as Oscar Wilde said, life imitates art far more than art imitates life. So if you want to learn more about space travel and aerospace engineering, please consider subscribing to this channel. And if you want to see even more aerospace content, feel free to follow me on Instagram. So let me know down in the comments below what you think of my new studio. And if you want to see more about the specific history of this unique attraction, make sure you check out the video in my description. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, Godspeed.